Logan Simmering, Green candidate for City Council in Cincinnati, Ohio, which actually had proportional ranked choice voting back in the day. And what happened there was black folks started getting elected, so the city establishment decided to get rid of it because this was in the 50s when civil rights movement was rising, and I guess those white folks didn't want to, you know, really have equal opportunity to be elected for black folks. But uh, so that's we've had this before. We can go backwards. That goes to the whole voting rights thing. <laughs> So anyway, Logan is running in Cincinnati, and uh, as I said earlier, he's an iron worker, got a bunch of building trades uh, backing him, endorsing him. So, Logan, tell us about yourself and your campaign and uh, the issues in Cincinnati. All right. So, as you said, Logan Simmering, I'm an iron worker at a local 44 in Cincinnati, running for city council because, uh, well, basically the modern world that we live in tends to disconnect and alienate us, make us feel powerless. And I want to build structures that'll push back on that so that, you know, the people can kind of take back control and set, uh, push against the influence of especially, you know, predatory property developers in our city and other private interests like that. And make, uh, our make our uh, city more livable and sustainable and democratic. Uh, so yeah, that's the uh, short version. Uh, it's been ex extreme honor to be uh, supported to the degree that I have been from the uh, building trades. Uh, my business manager at my union has been really. Uh, advocating for me behind the scenes with the uh, other unions and they've uh, really sort of come out with a uh, financial support and supporting me in other ways um so the big issues in cincinnati that we're kind of focusing on is uh, the affordable housing crisis it's not nearly as bad here as it is in a lot of other places but you can see it coming we have some very predatory landlords buying up properties and kicking people out and jacking up the rent. A lot of things we want to do to push back against that. Uh, we have a huge amount of the city that used to be much more densely constructed that's been kind of abandoned over the last several decades. And it's time to sort of fill that back in and make something that's more uh, walkable and cyclable and conducive to public transit that also needs more investment. Yeah, a hugely segregated city that we need to work on addressing those issues so that yeah, we don't have one neighborhood that's completely neglected sitting next to another that's hugely affluent with the stark color lines between them. All the sort of standard problems you see in cities across the country. That we're all, we have lots of plans to kind of Start fixing through popular power. So is this city, uh, is this election on the ballot nonpartisan? Yes. All but right. I did notice I looked up a newspaper article. They identified y'all by party in that in that paper. So yeah, like a lot, a lot of, of these nonpartisan races, the parties are in the background pushing their people. Yeah, there's a, there's endorsed slates from four parties in Cincinnati actually. The Democrats, the Republicans, the Charter Party, and the Greens. And tell me uh, about the Charter Party because that goes back to our ranked choice voting. Yeah, they uh, they started the proportional representation back in uh, twenty eight, I think, with the yeah you know, to get a uh, Cincinnati politics from stop being run out of the back of a bar from the sort of local party bosses and. As a to center, you know, the council manager system, which sort of continues, but the proportional system worked a little too well, and they got rid of that, which is a shame. Yeah. So now most people think the machine operating out of the bar, the political machine, was Democrat, but in Cincinnati, it was Republican. Yep. Uh, Charter used to be closely aligned with the Democrats. Later on, uh, they had a split because the Democrats 
didn't like sharing power. Charter got real weak for a while, but they're having a comeback since uh, we had, especially this year, we had three Democrats uh, indicted for corruption charges and a Republican. So that's been kind of a mess. A lot of people are uh, not happy with the parties here. Well, hopefully that bodes well for you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, myself, there's a, a DSA candidate that's looking strong, several independent candidates, and Charter has a full slate of people that, uh, yeah, some of them are better and than Charter others. Charter wants to bring back ranked choice voting? Is that their? They, no, they have not mentioned that at all. A few of the other independent candidates have been talking about bringing back proportional representation and some other amendments to how we uh, do elections, because we also are uh, at large for the whole city, which makes, you know, representation kind of arduous. There's talk about bringing back districts or mixed at large districts, various proposals, making council bigger. Nothing's very set in stone on that front, but people are talking about it because the current system's not working particularly well. Well, it sounds like a good environment to bring up proportional ranked choice voting because- Yeah, we've definitely been talking about that. And also I talk a lot about putting more power into the uh, hands of the community councils that we have, which are sort of independent community groups that the city recognizes and works with, gives a little money to. But the relationship with the city is very kind of unclear. I want to make it more definitive in the charter and use them as a vehicle for uh, participatory budgeting, some other things along those lines. So what is, who's behind Charter? Are they just sort of the good government people? That's, yeah, that's what their line is. The, they take tend to take a very, you know, theory, in theory, ideologically neutral approach to good governments. That's how they present it anyway, obviously. Not really anything as, such a thing as ideological neutrality, but. Yeah, that's kind of unique to Cincinnati. I mean, that's the way the progressive movement wanted it. Yeah. They, they, they wanted... Uh, city managers and fewer representatives and rank choice voting or, or single transferable vote, proportional representation to break up the machines. But they thought put the, you know, government in the hands of these technocrats. And yeah. what happened was, you know, working class people, women, black people, they all got in under those systems. And that's not quite what the middle class good government people had in mind. Right. Uh, and, you know, of course, the major parties didn't either. So it's interesting. Yeah, I think there's some potential to, you know, get some of that back in the future because we can sort of point to it working. And the reason that it went away was not that it failed, but that it really succeeded too much. So we'll so be there looking nine, at it in the future. Nine people up for election, nine seats. Yep, nine seats are up. Only one elected incumbent is running. A few appointed incumbents are running. 35 candidates <laughs> by. So it's sort of at large plurality. So yep. you need about, what, 10% of the voters to say, we want you? Something and like that. I think 6% might have been what got people in last time. I've always, always been looking at the. Uh, uh, Absolute numbers, which on the last election was like 22,000 was the cutoff, give or take. Interesting. Yeah, that's another problem with those at-large plurality elections is um, you tend to get a, a plurality that, you know, supports one slate of candidates or another, and then they all get elected, or almost all of them. Yeah. But... uh a little, little bit uh, open this year, so we'll see. Yeah, how things shake up in a couple of weeks. Well, let's see if we got. I think we got some questions that have been put in the chat. So I'll give that a second. See if one of those gets placed in there. Yes, here we go. Dust James, lots of urban decay, no? 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, so some parts of the city have gotten a lot of uh, reinvestment, revitalization in the last decade or so, particularly uh, neighborhood over the ride has been extremely gentrified. Uh, other parts are just kind of abandoned, semi-abandoned, kind of rotting with uh, very little investment. The trick is to, to uh, as we move forward, have more investment without displacing people so that we can have a city that has less urban decay and is not replacing that with just trying to become a, a playground for uh, rich people, especially you know, rich people from the suburbs. Which uh, got some plans to do that based around you know, social housing, community land trust, and making changes to sort of uh, zoning rules, things like that, which uh, hopefully we can get past. Yeah, I wonder, is do a lot of people from the more affluent suburbs commute to the city for their uh yeah, or they did before the pandemic. <laughs> now they're yeah, uh, well now now they work from home and uh, our huge part check of our tax base is in jeopardy. Is the medical uh you know hospitals and whatnot in the city? Yes. Yeah, we have a big cluster of them about a mile from where I live, where there are three yeah. of them and then they're well, you know, they have satellite offices and stuff like that, but most of the hospitals of, are in the city. A lot of people make middle to upper middle, you know, nice salaries, and they tend. And let you, I'm 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 going to ask you guys don't have a income local income tax, do you? Uh, we do uh, about one percent, I think. Oh, okay. It's uh it's capped by the state. We can't raise it willy nilly, but <laughs> okay, without uh, going to referendum. But we do. And have that one. includes people that earn their income in the city but live in the suburbs. Yes. Okay, that's good. I mean. I've been trying to get that in Syracuse forever because basically people in the city are poor. People in the suburbs got nice salaries. They come in the city, they use the services, and then they go out to the suburbs where they pay taxes. They don't pay taxes here. The poor people got to pay for their services. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have a yeah, three-way mix of sales, property, and uh, income tax to fund the city. So if any one leg is drops out on us, we're not totally out of luck, but budget is uh, definitely in jeopardy going forward. Eric Gray asks, Logan, what is your plan to build political power in your community along class lines? Um, a big thing I want to do is uh, support worker cooperatives so that, and uh, also yeah, our local labor unions so that people have a place to organize along economic uh, issues and also to invigorate our community council so that people in their neighborhoods are able to organize sort of trans class issues and that those are kind of would intersect to build power for people who are lower income and just workers in general. Isn't Cincinnati one of the cities that the steel workers use for a demonstration project on union co-ops? Yeah, uh, Co-op Cincy. It used to be Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative, which is a great project. I volunteer with them from time to time. Uh, there, um, so Synergy uh, Cooperative is organized through the steel workers. And uh, it's a shame they're a big project to get a train manufacturer through Mondragon fell through, but they're chugging along. They're uh, organizing lots of cooperatives. Uh, I think they have like a dozen in the works at the moment and five operational. And my hope is to use the uh, leverage the city to support that effort and expand it significantly. Wow. I didn't know it had developed that far. I mean, it sounds like a serious project. Yeah, they're doing uh, well for themselves. Uh, they have a symposium in November 6th, I think, for to bring people together nationally for cooperative issues, which people should check out. Amy L. Sachs, Logan, what is the first issue you tackle in your town if elected? Uh, my plan for first legislation to try to get, get in is a renter's bill of rights so that tenants have yeah, considerably more legal protections than they do against landlords who are extremely predatory and neglectful in this city. But 
that's that's issue number one and from there move on to more housing stuff and then start looking into uh, charter amendments to build more power into the community councils and look on uh, electoral issues things like that so the community councils are elected by different neighborhoods or are they sort of volunteer organizations where everybody can just come to the meeting yeah they're kind of volunteer organizations you have to uh you know become a member of them different ones have different rules but uh, what i'd like to see them you know sort of evolve in the way of you know democratic town hall town meeting type assemblies that would you know confederate to exert power themselves i do not have an ohio accent i have a i grew up in maine <laughs> yeah what <laughs> you at the comments there go ahead I said I was looking at the comments. Someone was asking where, where it's from, and you said the sound like I have an Ohio accent. I grew up in Maine, so I don't think I have an Ohio accent. Yeah, I was going to say what you're talking about with community councils basically becoming community assemblies and having real power is probably the most radical thing in your platform. Because yeah, it's kind of the central like radicalism of it. <laughs> yeah, I just want people to think about that because if you had like in New England town meetings where people come together. And they can uh, vote on policies, and then you know make their representatives in the city council accountable to them. Then the people are directly involved year round instead of uh, electing people to office and then hoping they do the right thing. <laughs> it's yep. uh, it's something I think that's what the Greens should mean by grassroots democracy. That is absolutely what I'm getting at. <laughs> Just, yeah, there are a lot of things that I want to do in the town, but that is sort of the real crux of my campaign is to empower people through now, were these democracy. Were these community councils encouraged by the city or did they just grow up organically? I'm, some of them are very old and I think they sort of pushed for the city to kind of recognize them and others once this was sort of established, an established thing, I think the city encourage them to happen not every neighborhood has one still too i think there are three or four that don't out of the 52 neighborhoods in this city and a lot of and they're uh, very unequal in how like, effective and active they are which is something that needs to be addressed yeah my city syracuse and, and a number of cities have sort of created these from the top down in the name of uh you know participation but they're really set up to be sounding boards for the city establishment and developers. So they bring their plans to the, here they're called today's neighborhoods tomorrow or something, tomorrow's neighborhoods today or something like that, TNT. And what they really are is a sounding board so the politicians and developers can find out where the resistance is coming from and figure out how to deal with it. Uh, you know, they're purely advisory and uh, so, you know, you can have empowered neighborhood or community assemblies, and you can have uh, things that are set up basically to steamroll stuff through the neighborhoods. So I'm yeah. just telling people you got to, you know, be careful, look at what you got. And what right. You got. As, it, as it is now, they're a little more towards the advisory section. Some of them do have some really great projects that they do on their own. It, yeah, it varies a lot from neighborhood to neighborhood. But uh, yeah. That's the re big reason I want to kind of clarify the relationship with the city so that they actually have like powers spelled out in charter that uh, can't be uh, pushed aside. Yeah, another issue that comes up, it sounds like it's true in Cincinnati, is some neighborhoods got people get involved and they're pretty active. Oftentimes, in my observation, that tends to be the well-educated middle-class neighborhoods. Um, and the rich neighborhoods aren't targets for developers and the poor neighborhoods uh, don't get a lot of participation. So part of the process of developing real neighborhood assemblies is the city's got to provide support and staffing so mm -hmm. that people know when the meetings are and the assemblies have some uh, people with expertise and skills that can help them do what they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. That is uh, a lot of how it is here. The, the most active and effective assemblies are in the more wealthy neighborhoods. Some of those that are really interesting projects on their own are in poorer neighborhoods, which I appreciate. But I definitely want to make sure that 
they have like adequate support from the city and adequate infrastructure to be able to function as a real democratic power based on their own. Sensi, can healthcare be fixed at the local level? Uh, I have some ideas along that line. So there's not a ton we can do. I'm planning, to, I would like to establish kind of a healthcare core that operates with volunteers backed by some professionals to do like frontline stuff. So yeah, preventative medicine, making check, checks on people, things like that. Just make sure they're sort of connected to the healthcare system. I uh, would kind of like to look into working with other cities to establish a kind of networked public health system, but that's very conjectural. There's a there's opportunities, but it's hampered a lot by the sort of weight of the national system. Gary Brown asks, Logan, any plans to encourage or work with mutual aid groups? Uh, personally, I do work with some mutual aid groups, and yeah, I would see city resources being directed in to their efforts so that they can reach out to uh, the community more effectively and actually provide resources to that, you know, very grassroots based uh, mechanism. Ashley R, how do you recommend implementing grassroots activism in undereducated hyper-religious rural communities where intersectionality is greatly misunderstood? That's a million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, I don't live in one of those communities, so I <laughs> don't have to deal with it too much. But I think the, yeah, just try to talk to people and find what common ground you can, chip away at it, and build connections is sort of the best you can do. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. We got to, uh, I mean, I've talked about deep canvassing in the past. So if you're living in one of those communities, you got to go out and talk to people and, you know, listen as much as you or more than you preach at them. And, uh, you know, once you hear where they're, what they're, where they're coming from, you can talk about, you know, where you're coming from as a green and, you know, uh, point to the, you know, common concerns and, you know, how your policies might help. Um, and then be active on issues because while there's cultural differences, uh, on economic class issues, there's a lot of common interest. And it's probably where, you know, the uh, commonality and the intersectionality can be built. Um, you know, that's what Reverend Barber is trying to do in West Virginia right now with the uh, Poor People's Campaign and putting pressure on Manchin. Um, and he's, he among, you know, sort of progressive leaders that are, although he's nominally an independent, he's pushing the Democrats. Uh, he's very clear on the intersection of race and class. Um, some people tend to push one or the other, but you can't have uh, racial justice uh, or class solidarity without mutual support. So, you know, deep canvassing is what I'm getting at, or relational organizing, as they call it in the labor movement. So that's my advice if you're in one of those difficult rural communities. Dus James asks, what kind of response do you get from doing public outreach? Uh, almost always positive. Uh, people like the idea of being empowered. They like the idea of addressing the affordable housing crisis. They like the idea of a city that's walkable and livable, and pleasant to be in and affordable. Uh, whether that translates into votes, we'll see, but people like what they have to hear from me. Yeah, I find people like to hear from you just because you knocked on their door mm -hmm. and nobody else has. And it's like, if you're ready to listen, some of them will pour their hearts out to you. Yeah, I've gotten some of that. <laughs> and even if they don't agree with you, they just like you because you showed up and listened. So, you know, I think that's, particularly in these local elections, that's where Greens can get elected. Uh, 
by people that agree with us on policy wise and by other people that just appreciate the fact that you know we're there at the grassroots and, and concerned. Yep. Absolutely. David Ellison. Here in Cleveland, we're intentionally trying to organize across neighborhood lines beyond the wealthier neighborhoods where the developers are having a heyday. We've had two mayoral candidate forums and have participation from both sides of town, black, white, male, female. It takes listening and actually hearing. It's clear elected officials and the developers are the problem and assisted by the Community Development Corporation and the planning department with other urban quote unquote planners. Yeah, I think that's uh, um, is that a question? I think it's a, a comment on what's going on in, in a lot of our cities um, and how yeah, this green is you know, trying to deal with that problem. Yeah, before we get to Andrea's question, I was going to uh, say that Cleveland has something that I think a lot of cities should. Uh, model or a you know, model. They got uh, something called, I think they're called the Evergreen Cooperatives. So they got mm -hmm. one, they got a bakery, they got a greenhouse urban garden, and they got an industrial laundry. And basically, yeah. the organizing got uh, Case Western University and the Cleveland Clinic, which are in the middle of a poor black neighborhood uh, to help fund these co ops. And uh, I know we got a situation like that in Syracuse that could be done. You've heard about uh, this uh, Democratic Socialist who got won the Democratic primary in Buffalo, India Walton. She's from a neighborhood that's being encroached by a medical complex uh, instead of helping that neighborhood develop. And I imagine, you know, you said you live near, near a medical complex. It's a situation a lot of cities. Cleveland provides a model to get some co-ops started that uh, help the people in these low-income neighborhoods as well as relate them to these big nonprofits, the Eds and Meds. Yeah, Evergreen's a model of using institutional anchors for co-ops is really smart. It's definitely something more places should be emulating. What happened to Andrea's question? Oh, well. She'll get back because she's, she's picking the questions. <laughs> you can do green urbanism and architecture too. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely want, you know, when we're uh, building social housing and other publicly backed uh, construction to make sure that architecture is designed sustainably and that it's, you know, built into the... Uh, fabric of the neighborhood effectively so that it's sustainable and ecologically sound energy uh, energy efficient energy you know passive as much as can be andrea merida Quayar. logan you said you could see a housing problem on the horizon can you say more about that and what do you see? Uh, so, you know, rent in Cincinnati is relatively low. It's been increasing very rapidly, though. And so are you know, housing prices to buy homes. But, you know, we can look around at other cities and see where it's much, much higher. And we want to avoid the sort of issues that other parts of the country are having that are starting to happen here before they get too much worse. Just make sure that housing is affordable, decommodified as much as possible, and treat it as a human right. Amy L. Sachs. Cam Gordon, who is a Green on the Minneapolis City Council, has spoken about his city council's work to get tenants legal representation when they face eviction. Yeah, that would be a part of the tenants bill, bill of rights I want to put forward. One of the more important provisions is guaranteeing a representation during the eviction. Ashley 
actually are. I do live in one of those areas, South Central PA. Thanks for your answer. I think this is one of the rural communities. In addition, how do you recommend addressing rampant transphobia and COVID-19 misinformation along the way? Uh, I mean, I think the best thing you can do is sort of establish a uh, rapport so people have some degree of trust in what you're saying and try to be consistent, but also sort of respectful of their views, regardless of how unpleasant they may be in correcting them. But I don't know, these are very hard questions in organizing, and I don't know if there are right answers, and I doubt that I have them. <laughs> Well, I think the trust thing you bring up is really important because a lot of this, you know, transphobia and the, you know, COVID nineteen misinformation, it's it's not rational, or they don't trust sources that do provide real information. Um, and then you got the whole social media thing where the most extreme, crazy stuff gets amplified by the algorithms of Facebook and Twitter. So people, I mean, I was doing phone calls for a Green candidate for city council, Connor Mulvaney in Pittsburgh. And I remember calling one young woman who had three kids, making a lot of noise in the background. She was having trouble focusing, but she was just complaining that she didn't know who to believe. You know, she listens to Fox and she listens to CNN and they're totally opposite. And she doesn't have time to figure out, you know, who these people are. And, you know, she's just very frustrated. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people that have these attitudes that, it's peer pressure and kind of noise that's in the atmosphere. And they're not going to hear you unless they know you and trust you. And then yeah. you can start to have a conversation. It may be a long conversation, but at least, uh, you know, like at work. I'm sure there are iron workers that, you know, probably got some bad attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, I know I had them among the Teamsters. But uh, if you respect each other and listen to each other, uh, you can have progress over time. So I think you got the right answer. You got to build trust. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard, torturous journey to deal with some of these issues and people's attitudes, but all you can do is kind of keep plugging away at it, unfortunately. And sometimes people will have epiphanies. Well, keep plugging away. That's another important thing. We can't just write these people off to the, you know, let the Republicans monopolize them with their crazy agenda. You know, we got to contest if that's where, you know, if those are people you're working with or, or living with, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be engaged. So John Eric Hegstad, do your local cops even wear masks? Ours don't. How can we get people to acknowledge climate change when they can't even understand masks? Yeah, uh, some of the cops wear masks, but a lot of them don't. And yeah, I mean, that's just a mess. Uh, I don't know. So much of like understanding these issues is being very like tribalized. And I don't, I don't know how to get through the, through the people along a lot of the stuff other than just keeping out there with what I at least think are the right answers. <laughs> but yeah, you look at, a lot of misinformation and the way people have, people have internalized it, it's discouraging. One thing, Especially just to give people power like cops. Yeah, my 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 gut wants me to ridicule the cops who act like such dummies. I mean, COVID nineteen is killing more of them than any other cause, and they seem to have a peer pressure thing where, you know, we're tough guys and, you know, we're right wingers, so we're not wearing masks even though they're endangering the public. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, I think, just to put an optimistic spin on it, I remember during the Vietnam War, you know, a lot of World War II veterans, auto workers where I lived, were very pro-war. Uh, but some of their kids started coming back in body bags or, you know, messed up physically or mentally from being over there. And then the Tet Offensive happened in Cronkite and other... Somewhat respected people were saying, you know, we can't win this war. 
And those people, like one day they were all pro-war, and in a very quick time they all flipped. And what that tells me is in the back of their mind, as the anti-war movement was speaking out and what, you know, the reality of the war was hitting them, they were changing their mind. Maybe they didn't even realize it consciously. So that sometimes, you know, public opinion will flip. Uh, look at gay marriage. I mean, the, the support for that went from very low in about 2005 in five or 10 years to majority support. Um, so these things can change very quickly. Uh, and if we put out arguments that people are resistant, maybe that means uh, they're trying to defend their own position for themselves. So that's just to give people hope that these things can change. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Uh, I think she, Andrea's probably looking. Here we go. Picture this new media, Ernest L. Pena. How would you feel getting a celebrity sponsorship and donation to help you get noticed? Depends on the celebrity, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we just had this discussion in New York because we're getting ready to put together a statewide slate. You know, and <laughs> when they ran me for governor in 2010, I was a nobody. Still am, really, in terms of celebrities. <laughs> and we got enough votes two times to get, you know, our ballot status. We lost it in 2020. And so we were throwing around a few celebrity names, but our experience in New York is, uh, shoot, I chased, uh, what's his name? A black actor, Ruby D and Ossie Davis. I chased Ossie Davis around a full employment conference, begging him to run for governor in 94. He kept telling me I had to run. I had no idea I eventually would. Uh, it's tough, you know, because, uh, some of them don't want to put their neck out like that. Uh, they got fan bases that are all over the place. Uh, so on the other hand, you know, we did get on the ballot with Al Lewis, Grandpa Munster, for those that remember, in 98. Um, and Ralph Nader, who was not a, you know, entertainment celebrity, but, you know, uh, Ralph Old Maine, we ran him for president. It got us some attention, although the media pretty systematically marginalized and ignored him. So celebrities can only take you so far. For sure. So I guess Cat Paradise is thanking for answers. What we got a what was that question? Violet at Content boutique. How do you feel about reparations for descendants of slaves? Absolutely necessary. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be kind of a national project, but in general, you know, I want to focus on making sure that resources are going to in the city that are to these communities that are predominantly black that are extremely marginalized to kind of undo some of the damage that's been done over the last several hundred years. Violet at Content Boutique has another question. What will you do to end qualified immunity for cops? Uh, I would advocate for uh, state representatives to deal with that. That's not something we can handle at the city level, unfortunately. But Yeah, I was just and reading. The Supreme Court is making so states can't handle it either. But uh, it's definitely something yeah. that needs to go away. I just read about a case in Ohio and Cleveland today about a black man that was killed by two cops. Uh, he was asleep in his car. One of them jumped in the car and ended up shooting him five times, killing him. Um, 
I mean, the guy was just waking up. He can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. These cops. And, and, and they got off because of qualified immunity. That's what the courts decided. Yep. Yeah, that's got to go. Well, we're getting close to the end of the hour, Logan. Unless another question pops up, you want to give people, you know, some final words about your campaign and how they can help? Yeah. So my campaign is all about building solidarity with the community. If uh, you want to help, my website just popped up. You can read a bit, bit about more about me, follow me on social media. Uh, donations are always welcome, as many, many political campaigns I've told you for years now. Uh, you can also uh, visit my volunteer section. Uh, if you're interested in phone baking, we can arrange some, ver some distance uh, application there and uh, yeah, amplify my, my campaign as you see fit. I appreciate any and all expressions of support. <laughs> Well, thank you, Logan. And uh, I, I do see a question in the chat that I'm going to answer. Is that the city council advocates for national popular vote? Um, I think that's a national popular vote compact. A number okay. of states have done. And, you know, city councils can push for it. Um, we can advocate, but we can't pass it. <laughs> right. But I was going to say that uh, an article by Rob Ritchie and some lawyers that is now in the Har a Harvard Law and Policy Review. It's online. So, you know, Google Lar Harvard Law and Policy Review. And it's about how Congress could pass a law without a constitutional amendment that would render the Electoral College uh, irrelevant because you'd have a national ballot and they go through the, you know, provisions of the Constitution that enables Congress to do this. So we now have a way to get to a, a ranked choice national popular vote for president. Um, and that's that's up online now. I've mentioned that before, but it's up online now. And uh, meanwhile, you know, the next couple of weeks are local elections. I hope people will help Logan. There are other green candidates you can help. Some are phone banking. Um, and you can help with that no matter where you live. Um, also, I mentioned the uh, ranked choice voting uh, referendums in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Broomfield, Colorado, and uh, Westbrook, Maine, and the petition in Kansas City uh, to get ranked choice voting on the ballot. All that's going on right now. And of course, this is where at the local level we can make the biggest difference. You know, I don't want people to get too discouraged when they see what's in or what's not in this Build Back Better reconciliation bill, which they say they're going to pass next week. <clears throat> and then what comes out of the Glasgow Climate Summit is totally inadequate in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with this climate emergency. Like I mentioned that UN Environment Program study came out this week. Uh, the, the, the nations of the world are planning to produce, what was it, twice as much uh, oil, gas, and coal uh, than we should produce in order to have any chance of staying below one and a half degrees Celsius global warming. So, no, you know, don't be disappointed. At the local level, we can make a difference. And, uh, you know, as I say many times on these podcasts, uh, we got to build strong mass-based local parties. That's where the deep canvassing goes in. We got to go beyond, you know, the normal people who, are, who right away come to an appeal for green activity or action uh, to other people that ought to be with us but don't know about us or they don't know us well enough to trust us. And we got to build that trust. So, um, you know, running for office like Logan is part of the way to do that. But we need to be doing that year round, you know, being out there talking to the people, knocking on their doors, listening to them and uh, being active ourselves, not just in elections, but, you know, with issue campaigns throughout the year. I think that's what we got to do. And, uh, you know, the old left, the Communist Manifesto said we got a world to win. 
you know, we literally do now with this climate emergency. So I hope everybody keeps the fighting spirit and, and stays active. So everybody have a good weekend and a good week. All right. Thank you for having me on. It was a Thanks. great pleasure. Thanks for coming.